The Sykes-Pico Agreement is a shocking document. It is not only the product of greed at its worst, that is to say of greed allied to suspicion and so leading to stupidity, it also stands out as a startling piece of double dealing. Hello and welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnon. And me, William Durimple. Now, that is quite a powerful quote, but... What is he going on about? Well, we're we're hoping to explain this in the podcast. First of all, William, who who is that quote from? That quote is from the great Palestinian nationalist leader, George Antonius, who in many ways was the sort of early Palestinian version of what David Ben-Gurion would successfully become, the political leader of of the Palestinians, the one, though, who, who failed to take the Palestinians to statehood. And this was his reaction on discovering the Sykes-Pico Agreement, which is what we're going to be talking about today, which is, I mean, it's one of those classic moments in imperial history, which, in a sense, the very reason that we're doing this entire podcast, where the Middle East is sort of stitched up by a bunch of people who share the same club in London, who are chums, who have very little personal experience of the Middle East. Sykes, who uh, is the main character we'll be talking about today, Mm. claims to have Turkish and Arabic, but probably has very little. And uh, he divides up the Middle East. It doesn't actually become the shape of the map that we have today, but it's the beginning of that process. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's that old hackneyed expression, all roads lead to Rome. Well, all catastrophes in the Middle East seem to lead back to this one episode where two men in a locked room decide the fate of an entire region uh, in which they do not live. And in many ways, you're going to, I think, hear echoes of of that sense of um, confusion, betrayal that happened over partition, where again, a man who didn't know an area is is seated in front of a map in a sweaty place where he doesn't want to be, but he has to solve this quickly and therefore just completely arbitrarily draws a line. And it is literally a partition. We are talking the partition of the Middle East here rather than the partition of India and Pakistan. Uh, But it is the same thing. And just as uh, we have shown, I think, in in our first series, how the partition of India and Pakistan is many ways the sowing the seeds of all the conflicts which still bedevil the region. So I think you can put a great deal of the current violence, anger, statelessness of some peoples, the refugee status of others, many, many of these troubles come down to the fudge that was the Sykes-Pico agreement. Well, as you, as usual, when we have a, a thorny issue like that, we like to call upon a big brain to come and uh, lead us through the minefield. And um, well, he, he's written an excellent book, and I commend to you, A Line in the Sand by James Barr, Britain, France, and the struggle that shaped the Middle East. James is with us. And James, just on very, very basic basic tenets. When you are trying to form a nation or even think about forming a national boundary, there are certain things that should be right at the top of your head, should be like demography, maybe you know, natural geographic barriers, economic viability. None of that mattered here, did it? None of it at all. None of it mattered at all, Anita. You're absolutely right. So they knew this even at the time. If you read things that were written at the beginning of the 20th century, British people who were involved in boundary drawing already knew that you had to have some sort of frontier. And in this case, there was no such thing. There was a a pencil crayon line across a map drawn in in great haste. And in some ways, it's understanding that context, the, the, the fact that it was a rush job that explains a lot of what happened. Was that, James, what drew you to write about this? Because this, you spent many years of your life unpicking this agreement and, and analysing it in great detail in your amazing book. What drew me in was that I had written a book already about Lawrence of Arabia. And the thing that I didn't know about him was that he was very anti-French. And it wasn't just him, it was the people around him. He, if you don't know anything about Lawrence, he started the First World War in Cairo and he worked in military intelligence there. Lawrence will be our next episode, in fact, following on from you. We got Anthony Satin on next week. So I don't want to I don't want to spoil yeah, him. Get too off much, his but... land, James. Get <laughs> off his land. Okay. There's a front well, I, shall, I, shall, I shall elbow Anthony aside, who knows loads about this. So uh, but there were lots of people there who were very anti French. And that was the thing that really interested me. And so A Line in the Sand is a story really about Britain and France, but it's about Britain and France in a part of the world where you didn't necessarily knew, know how, how much they are responsible for what has happened since. 
And in trying to explain, you know, how they ended up coming to blows there, I started with Sykes Pico. And I want to start with the personalities because I, I, I always get drawn into any story by just looking at pictures. I think it's maybe the way I tumbled into writing my first book. It was by an accidental view of a photograph. But I became quite obsessed with these mustachioed duo. So, I mean, you've got <laughs> you've got Sykes, who he's a sort of handsome, very kindly face, patrician, again, with this extraordinary uh, Edwardian throwback uh, moustache. And Pico on the other side, who's slightly harder faced, sort of looks a little like a skittle in a uniform with a with a, a less successful <laughs> facial furniture uh, <laughs> arrangement. But but let's start with Sykes. Let's start with the, the British side of this. Tell us about Sykes. Tell us this. Uh, let's first of all give him his full name because he's only Sykes of Sykes Pico to most people. He's Sir Mark Sykes uh, of Sledmere House, I suppose, is the, the best way of putting him. Which is a beautiful, beautiful house in, in the Yorkshire world. It is well worth a visit. Let's start there. It's a slightly funny looking place but it sits up on top of the, the Yorkshire Wolds and it's one of those country houses that slightly subverts the country house genre in that when you go in there you start to see strange things that you wouldn't see in a in a country house like like little sort of corgi sports cars on antique furniture and and mm. stuff like that and that is that little um I remember when I went there it's almost 20 years ago now uh, but you get this little insight into the humor of the family this part of the the family and Mark's father, Sir Tatton, was, they were baronets. He was a baronet. And he was an extremely unusual man whose interests included milk pudding, church architecture, and the maintenance of his body at a constant temperature. So he would go around putting on <laughs> overcoats and taking them off to try and keep himself at 36 point something degrees. Tell us more about the milk pudding. <laughs> oh, I don't, well, I, I think that's probably as deep as my knowledge goes. But he was the, he was the, the, the master of this, of this country estate. And, and Mark was his only child. And so Tatton had a very, very uh, odd and, and increasingly difficult uh, marriage to Jessica, his wife, who was pretty much half his age. And when you go to Sledmere today, there's these amazing Persian tiles and these, 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 these gorgeous Orientalist rooms. Is that Mark? That's Mark. Mark, Mark inherited the baronetcy uh, before the First World War. And, uh, and he had already been travelling widely around the Middle East, firstly with his father. His, it was his father who, who inspired his interest in, in that part of the world. And he was essentially an adventurous tourist with plenty of money. So he bought lots of souvenirs, including those... Beautiful tiles. Yeah. Wonderful isnic tiles. Yeah, no, I mean, just, just drilling down to that. So this is a man who has, a, you know, a fondness for the Middle East. But is he, as he claims, fluent in Arabic and Turkish? Is he, as he claims, a man who can draw the map of the region on the back of his hand? How much does he know about this area? So the, the simple answer is, no, he couldn't speak Arabic or Turkish, but he was one of those people who went round saying Alhamdulillah and, and <laughs> Allahu Akbar whenever something good happened to him. And, and so he went into it. There's a very famous cabinet meeting. We'll come on to that. But, but he, he left people in that room with the impression that he was fluent in both, both languages and, and that he certainly was not. Okay. Well, actually, I mean, let, let's get into that cabinet meeting. You've given us a beautiful tee up for it. So you're, the meeting you're talking about is the 16th of December, 1915, uh, behind that very famous black door at number 10. What is going on? So they face, uh, the cabinet faces a very awkward crisis, which they had not wanted um, and they wanted to deal with as quick as possible. And this was over the need to reach some kind of diplomatic arrangement with France over the future of the Middle East. If we're going to go, if, we, if we're trying to explain all this, the background is Gallipoli. So going right back, everyone will know that the First World War was supposed to have ended by Christmas 1914. But of course, it didn't. And as that became clear at the end of 1914, a group of British politicians, officials started to try and think of other ways to win the war. They were called the Easterners, and the idea that they came up with was to attack the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, land at Gallipoli, which is all of 150 miles away from the capital, Istanbul, and, and knock the Turks out of the war. And they thought that would be an easy job. Yeah, we've had a whole podcast on Gallipoli just uh, a few weeks ago. 
so there we go. And, and in fact, at that time, initially, the, the clever idea was to land both at Gallipoli and at a place called Alexandretta, which is modern Iskanderun. So it's somewhere that's just been very badly affected by uh, the earthquake, the earthquake. That's, yep. that's happened in Turkey. It's the port that sits at the sort of the, the kind of crook of where Syria joins Turkey. And it's a deep water port and it was very important. And the British thought they would land there and and cut various communications, the railway, the telegraph, and leave the Turks in, in, in chaos. And that would make their job at Gallipoli easier. But it didn't happen because of French suspicions. And this brings in the French side of things, because Britain and France have been rivals in this part of the world for 100 years or more. The French, as soon as they got wind of the Gallipoli idea, their worst suspicions were raised. They thought that Britain wasn't really interested in dealing with the war on the Western Front, winning the war. They were off on some kind of great imperial adventure. Mm. And so the Sykes-Picot agreement grew out of this. It was it was something that was made necessary uh, to allay French suspicions in early 1915. But in the way of one of these sort of bureaucratic deals, it, it actually way outlasted Gallipoli because by the time it was signed at the end of 1915 and, and the map was signed off in January 1916, there was no chance of Gallipoli ever succeeding. That's fascinating. So it's mm. a kind of the diplomatic and the kind of bureaucratic momentum is carrying on even as events are completely changed. We're nowhere near knocking Turkey out of the war. Total failure in Gallipoli, massive mm. defeat. And yet the committees are still grinding on, drawing lines on maps and making grand plans for the post-Ottoman world. And, and the exactly. line, the line on the map. Now, is it true, again, this is you can tell me if this is true or not, that Sykes in this meeting, this fateful meeting at number 10, says, let's just draw a line from the E of Acre through to the K of Kirkuk. And that's how we'll do it. Did he say that? That's what the minutes say. So the minutes of this meeting, you know how often people... You've when actually they got write, the minutes out and they do actually say that, Acre to Kirkuk. They, they, they do say that because, I mean, I, I once in a job I did wrote minutes and the aim was to keep them as bland as possible mm. and, and paper over disagreement. But the wonderful thing about this particular set of minutes is they look, they certainly read like a verbatim account. Jeez. So you get these wonderful snatches of, of extraordinary dialogue, including... This phrase. So the thing that Sykes Sykes went into that meeting, knowing that they needed to, to reach a deal with the French, and trying to suggest something that he thought would work. So he says he wanted a belt of English controlled country across the region, running from the Mediterranean Sea right up to the, the border with what was then called Persia. And the idea was that would be a cordon that would keep all other comers as far away from India as possible. Which meant in this particular circumstance, presumably Russia in particular, which mm. is at that point looking as if it's going to move south. and Both Russia and France. So uh, historically, the, the big British concern was Russia. It was Russia's threat to India, either through Afghanistan and Central Asia, or increasingly from the 1870s onwards, they were worried about Russia coming down through what is now Iraq, and, and launching an attack on India that way. So that was that was the big thing. Uh, but so Sykes comes into the meeting, he wants this belt of, of country, and he says this magical line, or a magical appalling line, he proposes a line from the E of Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. Okay, I've, forgive me. But uh, tell me, tell me in the minutes, is there not an app, because this is not a, you know, a cabinet of idiocy at the time, are there not people who then throw up their arms saying, Stop being such a stupid ass. How can you just suggest just drawing an arbitrary line on an atlas from two letters? And what, what is the reaction to this suggestion? I think there's, there's two things going on. The first thing is the context. And the context is that the cabinet is more worried about conscription. There are lots of other things it has to think about. And the Middle East is, is very, very low on its priorities. I think this is this is always the case. And, and the more I study imperial history, you find that huge and massive decisions happen at the end of cabinet meetings when when several other things are on the agenda. And it, a bunch of people have no idea about the geography, the ethnography, the history or the politics of the place end up making a decision very quickly that's going to have massive historical repercussion. Mm. But is there dissent? I mean, just please tell me some people, even, even if time is running short and the box needed ticking and you need to move on, to any other business. Tell me some people saw this for the, the bizarre thing that it was. Definitely. So there were there were four people in that meeting who really mattered. And Asquith, the Prime Minister, was sort of running out of steam. I think that's the politest way to put it. Uh, there was Kitchener, who had worked in the region, who 
sort of was interested in in the situation. He'd been in Egypt for a while, hadn't he? He had been the High Commissioner in Egypt, or the Governor Governor General, exactly. And and so he did know the territory, and he he knew a lot of the people. And in fact, Mark Sykes worked f- for him, Paul so yeah. so he had you know he he kind of knew what was going on. But so and the other two people in the meeting who mattered, who had completely different views on this subject, were Arthur Balfour, who had been uh, the Conservative Prime Minister. Mm, there's a declaration coming there somewhere. Carry there's on. A declaration, <laughs> there's a declaration coming there. Well, this is the thing. So the th- most in- interesting thing about the entire set of minutes is that Balfour is the sceptical one. He's the one who says, why are we trying to, to take Ironic. over the bit east of... Yeah. Egypt. So in 1915, two years before he put his name to a declaration that essentially was designed to extend British imperial control over Palestine, he was saying, are you sure this is a good idea? And the other person was Lloyd George, who, of course, goes on to be prime minister. In a, in a sense, it's it's the fact that these two people, Balfour and Lloyd George, do end up in a position of power, which is what matters. And both Lloyd George and Mark Sykes are extremely religious, and their knowledge of the Middle East is really based on biblical learning. They're used to seeing biblical names on the map. They've also both gone through classical education. So when they're thinking about the Middle East, they're not looking at an Ottoman map. Uh, They're looking beyond that, in a sense, to their education with, with the classics and in the Bible. That's right. And that's something that I underplayed in my book and I increasingly think is really important. Balfour as well. They, a book I read makes the very interesting point that a lot of the members of the cabinet at that time had grown up in the fringes, in the, in the, in Wales, in Scotland. They had received very, very traditional and, and religious educations. They also, unfortunately, had an idea that places like Palestine were fairly empty. There was this mm. view that everyone lived in a tent and could pick up their tent and move it somewhere else. Like there's David. Robert's Prince, where they just have a few Bedouins scattered yeah, around. Yeah, there the was always a few Bedouins in the in the foreground, aren't they? Before the the picture of the the domes and the minarets in the background, or the ruins, and the you yeah. know. But this, it's the sparseness, isn't it? That when you see a Robert's picture, there's never that many people in it, and that's critical. Well, I mean, if you if you if you're going to crush a region, you need to, the two hands to clap together. The other hand belongs to the French. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a good idea to point out what their position is. So. The, the British, you know, thinking that the Ottoman Empire is about to collapse, have, have withdrawn because they want to keep their mercantile safe. But the French have been spending quite a few years filling that gap. So they have ambitions, don't they? Um, and they're also looking to see what bits they might be able to hive off should the whole thing fall to pieces. The French, it goes back to, it goes back to the Battle of the Nile. From then on, from 1798 onwards, the French are trying to get back in. And and even beyond that, the French are sort of obviously being taught in their schools because you see this coming up over and over again in their memoirs and in their writings about the Crusades. And at the end of this, when 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 the French actually do march into Damascus, the general famously goes up to the tomb of Saladin and says, "Nous revenons, Saladin." Do they march into Damascus? Is that a spoiler? Is it? Yes, I think he <laughs> does this. He does this, James. He does this. We'll, we'll get back to that. Yes. We, might <laughs> we might return to that. Everybody delete that from your memory banks and pretend that didn't happen. Oh, you're hilarious, I'm really William good Darrell. at telling stories. Hilarious. <laughs> anyway, t- t- let's, go back, let's go back to previously. Previously yeah, on this, what are, the French, what are the French thinking and what, what's forming them? Yeah, why are they thinking And why do they way? think the Crusades gives them a right to end of this? So, so yeah, there is that, there's that strand. It's, it's, like, it's easy to take the mickey out of, really. But there is a strand of French thinking that, as you say, goes right back to to King Louis and, and the Crusades. And, and of course, the French were then given a, a kind of privileged position in the Ottoman Empire in the, in the 1500s. They were under something called the Capitulations. They got uh, their sort of role protecting the religious places of the Holy Land was, was recognised by the Ottomans. So it goes all the way back to there. But I think the key thing is the 19th century, where they backed uh, Muhammad Ali, the pioneering, modernising, tyrannical ruler of, of Egypt. And then, of course, they were instrumental in, in building the Suez Canal after that. So at a point when Britain was beginning to rethink its policy, it was beginning to pull back and realise there were limits to what it could could do, the French were investing more and more heavily, and they invested in particular in 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 utilities, so electric lights, the water company. Uh, they 
bought a railway concession and built that down into, into Lebanon. So there was stuff like that going on. And that meant that the French had more and more of an interest, a financial interest in what was going on. And they also had this bigger cultural interest. So if you were, if you were an Ottoman in 1900, let's say, and you had ambitions for your children, you would have sent them to a French school. You wouldn't have sent them, you wouldn't have put them into the, the state education system that was run by the Ottomans because that wasn't very good. Instead, you'd have, you'd have packed them off to a French school. You still find this, don't you, in places like Cairo, that the, the, the elite in Cairo speak perfect French and less good English? Exactly. And if you go to, so I remember going to Baalbek in, in northern Lebanon some years back. And if you look there, you can see graffiti from 100 years ago written sort of way up where someone's managed to clamber up. And the best thing about that graffiti is that the handwriting is French. It, it's written by an Arab, but the, the handwriting is absolutely... In the French you know, cursive. It, it's, 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 yeah. French, so it's French handwriting. They have learned that, you know, their That's handwriting has been learned like that. What does the graffiti say? Sorry, I just, this is fascinating. What kind of thing? I can't remember. It's someone's name. Jean-Pierre it's, it's was someone here who, kind of thing. Or, Oh, Ab- Abdul and, and Mohammed was here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's exactly, and it, so it's a so it's an Arab name, but written in, he- so in French handwriting. Well, look, look. This is this is now we've set the stage beautifully for uh, entry. Um, the man who I was a little unkind in describing as a skittle in a uniform, but Pico. <laughs> it doesn't certainly doesn't do justice to his amazing moustaches. Well, which we, I think, which but I, need guess, to be I mean, I think it's a bit scraggy <laughs> compared to um, Mark's. Not that these things are important in this story, but I, you know, he, he came off less well, I thought, in the mustachio stakes. It's the full. Walrus. There's two long sort of sideburns. He'll and got the face bits to support it. Flying in the air. And Doesn't then... <laughs> have the face to support it. It's just too much. It's too much. How could you support a, a moustache like that? Well, it's a fantastic some kind of scaffolding. That, I would have thought. <laughs> but anyway, so yes. back to who is he? Who is he? And what? Why is he here? And how important is he going to be? So, Anita, you said, I mean, the thing about Sykes was he had this twinkle, even if he was a bit of a chancer and he was sort of making it up as he went along. He's slightly a liar pants on fire. I mean, I'd go that he far. Is. He was huge, but he was hugely engaging. He was and charming people, too, wasn't he? People, he was hugely charming. Hugely charming. And, and people, you know, people couldn't help but like him, even if they, they knew, you know, they knew that he was, he was... Um, it's a podcast. We can say a bullshitter. A bullshitter. Yeah, Thank and you. a bit of a bullshitter. Yes. OK. But he a charming was, exactly. bullshitter. So, yeah. exactly. Charming one. Uh, and, and so he was, you know, pleasant, pleasant to deal with and, and, and so on. François-Georges Picot, to give him his full name, which I'm sure he would have expected had he been... As he, if he were a listener, was not like that at all. He was, I think, by all accounts, a fairly humorless character. Mm. Um, he was called George. His, so the family name is Pico, but his father was called George Pico, and he was a very famous um, sort of opinion former. I think we call him today. He was a lawyer. He'd written lots of books. He'd written a book about the British takeover of Egypt in 1882, among other things. And Francois took his father's full name as if to say, "Well, I am the son of this." this great man, uh, Georges Picot. And he went into the law like his father did, but clearly he didn't flourish there. And in 1898, and this is the critical thing, I think, trying to work out what was going on inside his head. In 1898, he decided that he would shift, he would change career and become a French diplomat at the Quai d'Orsay. And that is a crucial year because it's the year of the Fashoda incident, one of these magnificent kind of squabbles between Britain and France that nearly went to war. So Fashoda is a place on the Upper Nile. The French came up with the brilliant idea of trying to take that part of what is now Sudan and and essentially so they could damn it, so they could render British rule in Egypt downstream impossible. Uh, but the British, who at that point didn't really control that part of the world at all since, since the murder of Gordon, hurried southwards, uh, they launched an expedition, they then sent a, a party on to confront the Frenchman who'd planted the tricolore on uh, the Nile at Fashoda, and, and the French were forced in rather ignominious circumstances to back down. And that is the story that was playing out as Francois-Georges Picot became uh, a diplomat. So, I mean, does that, because he's sort of famously not a great fan or not a great truster of the British... I mean, how hard as it hard as it is to believe that the French and the British don't trust each other, that he particularly does not. And is it does this sort of proceed for Shoda, or does for Shoda set his mind as to what he thinks the Brits are about? I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I think that the whole family was very much 
uh, tied into Fre- the French Empire. They were they were strong promoters of it. But I think they sort of reinforced prejudices. So he he saw you know he saw what was happening, and he and others took away the lesson from this that you know when you were dealing with the with the, with the British, you needed to be a lot tougher. Let's now get to the point. We need to jump ahead because otherwise we could talk about this stuff all, all day. When do the mustachios entwine? When do they be, when do they cross paths? And what is what is the what are the terms of engagement between the mustachios? Yeah, the the the, 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 the the clash of mustachios happens because the committee that so Britain Britain wonderfully the British government set up a committee to des- decide what it wanted if the Ottoman Empire collapsed. This is the De Bunsen committee, isn't it? This called? is the yeah. De Bunsen committee, which is a bunch again of sort of classicists who, whose knowledge of the Middle East is all from Omer. And I wouldn't like to be quizzed on exactly who the members were, but Sykes was the youngest man on this committee, and he was then after they come up with their plan, which was really to sort of allow a kind of a series of patchwork of of, of sort of little states to emerge that Britain would try and influence, manipulate, whatever. Sykes got sent off to India to sell this deal to people who were going to be much more sceptical about it. The, the, the government of India, the British government of India at that point, were very much believers in the, the straight line approach to... We've met some of these characters in previous broadcasts. This is Lord Harding sitting in Calcutta, who wants to absorb the whole of the Middle East into his department, doesn't he? He, want, he thinks it should all become under the rule of Simla and Calcutta and be ruled from India, obviously. And they had great schemes. They had they had an idea that they would they would fix all of the, the ancient irrigation of of what is now Iraq that had been allowed to collapse, and they would turn the the country back into a you know the breadbasket of of India. So Sykes goes off to do that, but on his way back, he comes to Cairo, and unwisely, he kind of confides what's going on to a pair of French diplomats as he <laughs> as he came. He's sitting in a bar. I mean, he just lets it out over a G and T, or well, no, I suppose he thought you know I, I mean, it's understandable. He thought they are they were they were our allies which is, you know, charming. But of course, the thing that the French diplomats do is perk up their ears and say, well, we didn't know anything about this. And also, this. We've, we've got, you know, don't be pushing on Syria. I mean, some of this stuff is ours. Well, only as ours as, as the rest of it was ours um, from a British point right. of view. I mean, it was no more theirs than... <laughs> well, than... No, absolutely. But in their heads, I mean, they've already, you know, it's game, set and match. They've already, I mean, this is the autopsy of a place that isn't dead. It's, that's what's so horrifying about this. Exactly. And I mean, even I mean, the diplomats may not have actually thought, you know, they might they might have been in there thinking that Syria wasn't wasn't necessarily, you know, shouldn't be French. Mm. So these two French diplomats send back a report and that reaches the desk of of Del Casse, the the French foreign minister. And I mean, he like like people on the British side are a bit sceptical about all this, but he faces a lot of pressure from the French colonial lobby. And in that lobby, is Francois Georges Picot and, and the other parts of the Picot family. And it's they who put the pressure on the French and say, look, you have to stand up to these Brits are going to steal a march on you again. You've got to do something about this. And uh, Francois Georges Picot, who who had served briefly as France's consul to Beirut before the war, but he engineers himself a job as France's negotiator in London. So he writes his own negotiating brief and, and arranges for himself to, to end up in the French embassy. Well, now let's let's introduce the, th- the third key person in, in all of this, the Sharif of Mecca. Tell us about him. Who is he? And uh, what is he like? So he's the, the complicating factor because Whilst all this has been going on uh, between Britain and France, the other thing the British have been doing is trying to reach some sort of deal with Sharif Hussein. And Sharif Hussein uh, claimed to be descended from uh, the Prophet Muhammad. He had taken over running Mecca in, in so a few years before the, the First World War broke out. Uh, but he was a rather obstreperous and an independent-minded man. You get an idea of who he was. There's one one important fact, fact he, about him, he was the, the man who had the telephone number Mecca One. <laughs> That's wonderful. And uh, so from his sort of his kind of big house in, in Mecca, he ran things. But he was, he was quite sceptical about the Ottomans. He didn't really want Ottoman interference. The Ottomans, he found out about a plot where the Ottomans were trying to, to, to bump him off. And and so the British the British were were quietly behind the scenes sending him letters and gradually they they managed to 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 reach well a, a deal with him, but he makes a very big demand. He says, "Look, if I'm going to support you, if I'm going to revolt against the Ottomans, then you need to recognise 
my claim to a vast swathe of what is essentially the the Arabian Peninsula, but territory right up as far as the the modern border between Syria and Turkey. So we have our three characters. We've got Mark Sykes with his house parties and his sort of tourist Arabic. We've got Pico and his moustaches and his suspicion of the British, but is a professional diplomat who knows how to negotiate, unlike Sykes, who doesn't. And then you've got the Sharif of Mecca, austere, turbaned, white-bearded, and suspicious, really, of, of both these characters, but with no option because the Ottomans are, are planning to assassinate him and, and this his his best chance. So three people with very, very different interests. After the break, we'll have a look to see how this resolves. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about the three pivotal characters who would form the backdrop to this sykes pico line, which now defines so much of Middle Eastern politics in the world. But we should go back, James, because there's one person we didn't mention before the break, and that is Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary. Because again, you know, if you are somebody who is planning, future planning for the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, as everybody seems to be, do you see allies in these other two or do you see rivals in these other two? What is the British attitude to, to all of this interest that is coming in? I think that you've just touched on what is the sort of fundamental weirdness of this, which is the British are thinking to a post-war world in which they won. And in that world, their big rivals are not going to be the countries that they have defeated. It's not, it's not the Ottoman Turks and the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians that they've got to worry about, but it's their allies. And that is the mindset that is driving all of this. So the First World War breaks out. Britain is allied to, to France and to Russia. But at this point in the discussions, the, 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 the whole thinking behind the discussion is, after the war, we're going to face a challenge from, from France again in this part of the world and, and, and from Russia. So we need to come up with some sort of strategic idea that, that protects us and protects India from both of them. And who, who, do they, who do they sort of the British trust more? Because, I mean, it's kind of almost choosing between two people you dislike very, very much. Because they don't, I mean, historically, we know that Asquith and Lloyd George do not like Muslims and Arabs. And yet we know the British have historically hated the French forever and ever. So, I mean, plus, yeah. Plus the British uh, think that the Arabs are basically on the Ottoman side. And while they're negotiating with the Sharif of Mecca, they're pretty well assuming that the Arabs will not rise up. Uh, we know, of course, in retrospect, what happens. But mm. at the time, they're assuming that the Arabs are going to be uh, with their Ottoman masters. Well, not for the last time. There's, there's sort of extremely dubious intelligence coming from the Middle East <laughs> before a, a ma major <laughs> British military action. And, I mean, they just... they. They didn't know. They, they had snippets of information suggesting that there were these Arab secret societies that existed. So, so before the war, the Arabs had, had wanted greater autonomy within the Ottoman Empire. There, were, you know, there was a sense of nationhood building, things like new, the, the growth of newspapers, for example, Arab literacy. There was a much Particularly greater... Particularly among Arab Christians, aren't they? Because they've been educated by generations of missionary schools. They are, uh, they've gone to university abroad. Many have come back and founded newspapers or liberal institutions of civic society across the Ottoman world uh, in places like Damascus and Alexandria and, and Beirut. Uh, and there's a lot of development. Uh, uh, and, and Arab nationalism, if, if only the British had been looking out for it, was there in plain sight. Some of the British were looking out for it. But the point was, I suppose, is that Sykes wasn't. Sykes was, you know, he was a romantic and a traditionalist. He liked to go there to see the old mm. stuff. He went there yeah. to see, you know, the crumbling architecture and the, you know, people wearing extraordinary costumes and as he saw it. So it was stuff like that that interested him. Whereas, in fact, there was also a railway line and there were telegraph poles sprouting up and there was... You know, oil concessions. <laughs> oil concessions. And he, he was alive to that, interestingly. So one of the things he did, I've just been, just been reading about, and I've seen the report in the National Archives, he wrote a report about oil, about the prospects for oil in Iraq when he was a diplomat. Mark Sykes did what year? 1906 wow. or so. Yeah, but impressive. do you know what happened to that report? It was just completely ignored. Mm. So he sent it back. It, was, it had some nice maps in it. And it said, look, here are the, the places that look like they might have oil. And it just it died a death. So, so Sykes went into the negotiation really thinking that oil was 
not important. And that's a, another crucial thing that Sykes Picot is not about oil. No, okay, so 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 we're back back to you know the people now who have to make decisions. And and it, this is sort of largely largely in in the lap of the foreign secretary. Like, who is he going to side with? Who is he going to trust? Now, does he have a, does he have a favourite contender? I don't think he does. I think the point is about him is that he is tired, like the rest of this government in nineteen beginning of nineteen sixteen. He is tired, and there is a wonderful uh, little chit of paper again in the archives that really sums this up, because when the, the discussion about what terms they should offer. Sheriff Hussein secretly arises. Uh, someone comes up with a form of words, and in the cabinet meeting, this must be given to Gray, Sir Edward Gray, who's the foreign secretary, and he writes on a little piece of paper. He writes Lord K, so that's a reference to Lord Kitchener, and he goes, and then the next line says, "Will this do?" question mark, and then E G, and and this is the thing, and this is what illuminates just how at sea all these people were with the particular issues in this part of the world. It wasn't what they were worrying about. They were thinking about the, the domestic uh, consequences of having to bring in conscription to, to mobilise yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, sure, okay. But what happens is this makes it all, I mean, just history turns on the most uh, frustrating things. So, you know, you've got a knackered cabinet. You've got this sort of three parties in, in, involved in, as I said, performing an autopsy on, on a body that isn't dead. But there is a there is a missive that goes off to the, the Sharif, which seems to suggest that Britain will back them up, that Britain will allow them the territories that they want. I mean, is it, is it that it's a deliberate attempt to mislead them? Because, you know, inevitably it's Sykes-Picot, it's not Sykes-Sharif, is it? It will be Sykes-Picot that decides this, this re- reformation of, of what will be the Middle East. Are they lying to them or are they just too knackered to actually make themselves clear and it's ambiguous and therefore the Sharif takes it one way but the Brits mean it another way? Well, so this is exactly what happened. They, it was deliberately obscure. What the, the wording that they wrote, and you can see all the drafts of this in English, the wording that they chose is, we won't go into it here because it's just a bit too much, but they they chose a very, very careful set of words. And those words were then lost in translation when they were written in Arabic and sent to the sheriff. And they only found this out in 1920. So the British lost their copy of what was sent. I think it sort of ended up down the back of a filing cabinet. Did they lose their copy or... Lose their copy. Lose their copy. <laughs> well, no, I think they probably lost it. In I, I, I think conspiracy. I'm always for the cock up theory of history over the conspiracy. Yeah, I think it's the cock up. Yeah, I think I think this is the the British government at its Rolls Royce finest, and they did actually lose the thing. But most importantly, they but they they created something where they were going to trip up over their own shoelaces because they'd set out to to be disingenuous. They uh, they need, but they also needed to keep the sheriff on side. So the thing that had happened, the crucial thing that had happened, was just as Sheriff Hussein said, "Right, I want all the Middle East." They then heard this intelligence from a man called Faruqi, who was a an Arab soldier in the Ottoman army who'd been taken prisoner at Gallipoli, and he confirmed this idea of all the sort of there was a sort of Arab network working beneath the beneath the surface. The Arabs were weighing up whether to back British or the Germans at that moment in time. So this was all very very finely balanced, and and this all this sort of information arrives in cabinet cabinet struggling to to cope with it but kind of sensing there is something really bad here. So they delegate the whole job back to the British in Cairo and just say, look, fix it. We don't care. In in a way, we don't care how you do it, but just don't let this blow up on us. Uh, and so that gives the local the local officials a great deal uh, of, of, of wiggle room. Uh, and unfortunately, they then, they then cock and it up. And they're the ones negotiating with the Sharif. So they're negotiating with the Sharif. Bear in mind, the Sharif knows nothing about Sykes, Sykes and Pico. They, he doesn't know that simultaneously or, you know, uh, yeah, simultaneously, the British are having to deal with the French. But the French, again, get wind of the negotiations with the Sharif. And they can't believe that the British would do something as, as unwise as make a big promise to somebody who they think is a non-entity. We haven't actually talked about the negotiations that are, are going on between Sykes and Pico, or headed up by Sykes and Pico. So where are these happening? What is the what is the level of negotiation that is going on? And at what point is Pico told about um, the kind of ambiguous, weird letter that's gone out to, to the Sharif? So, so the negotiation with Sykes and Pico hasn't started when Pico hears the all-important confirmation that, yes, the British have sent Hussein the promise. So that happens. So 
Pico gets himself posted to London and he has a strange meeting where he is sort of on one side of the negotiating table. On, on the other, there are representatives of all the relevant British government departments. So it's a, it's a pretty uneven away fixture for him. And he's, so he's there. And the British realise that they're going to have to come clean about what they've promised to say because they, they, they really want Pico to agree to it. They want him to say, OK, you know, I, I see, I, I can understand that your concern about about the Ottomans is so great that you need the sheriff on your side. But of course, Pico doesn't. Pico plays a blinder and he looks sort of offended, affronted, everything at the same time. He, he, he has an inkling of what's going on, but he is also an extremely good actor. And a very good negotiator. And a very good negotiator. And the thing that he says is that is he touches on the, you know, on the, the really raw bruise that that affects the Entente all the way through, which is that the French have lost far more soldiers in this war so far and have Germans on their territory. And I was thinking the other day, you know, if you think of the pressure that Zelensky is under in Ukraine, you get an idea of what it was like for the French back in 1915. They were they had the Germans on their soil. And yet here were the British saying, well, let's go off to Gallipoli. We'll, we'll fix this war, but it's going to be the long way round. You know, the French are facing massive public pressure at home to, you know, to launch an offensive to end the war. And the British are on manoeuvres. So, so Pico does this faux flounce, which is, you know, diplomatically very powerful. Did the British panic that, OK, what did they do? And so the British do panic because they think they, they have been wondering for a little while by late in 1915 when this is. You know, do the French have it in them to last this out? Uh, you know, our French casualties are very, very high. What is pre- French public opinion feeling? And for a long time, the British thought, well, oh, I think they'll, they'll they'll manage. But then you start to get these reports coming from the British embassy in Paris saying, well, we're not so sure anymore. We're not so confident. So this uh, question over what will happen to the Middle East suddenly acquires a, a much greater significance. And the fear is, you know, if we if the British insist on their you know, what they want, don't give the French um, something in return, that this might be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. But what do they want? We, have, we haven't even yet sort of said in these negotiations around the table while they're sitting in front of a map, what, what is the, um, you know, the, the kind of trading that is going on? Like you take Libya and I'll take Syria. I mean, how, you know, at what level is it being pitched? So this, it really only concerns the sort of the narrow heartland of the Middle East. Bear in mind that the, the bigger the bigger question of Morocco and Egypt had been resolved by the Entente Cordiale in 1904. So in, under that, the British said to the French, "You you you know, we won't get in your way in Morocco." And the French uh, finally acceded to sort of British control of of Egypt. But this is about really this is about it's about it's about Palestine, what is now Israel and Palestine, and it's about Syria and Lebanon, where the French have got. That's where the the French interest is strongest. And just to add, add the element, we're going to talk about the Balfour Declaration in a different podcast, but how far are, 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 are negotiations with the Zionists and all that strand of things going? Is Balfour, is he dreaming of the Balfour Declaration already? Is Rothschild and he in, in discussions? So, I mean, there are certainly some people already working on that, but I think the critical thing is, and this does affect the Sykes-Picot story, so I think we, we maybe we should try and touch on it in a minute or two, but the quest, the thi- so the thing is that the British are aware. They're aware of, or, or they believe that there is there is significant support for Zionism, and that that needs to be accommodated in some way. But it hasn't yet become a, a, a sort of neurosis for the British. We, we've established that both Lloyd George uh, and Sykes are extremely religious, and they have a very religious worldview. How far is that affecting their attitude to the Zionist cause? It is affecting it. It, it's in, it influences their their worldview, and it, it helps explain a strand of British pro pro Jewish policy uh, that goes back fifty years by by now. But I don't think it's the it's not the critical factor right yet. That that comes after the Sykes Picot deal has been done. Got it. Got it. So at this point. Palestine is being disputed between the English and the French on one side and the Sharif of Mecca on the other. There isn't a, a Zionist claim on it at, at the cabinet at this point. Not a powerful one, but it becomes it becomes an issue after the... So, so the, the thing about the Sykes-Picot agreement was they couldn't agree about Palestine. They, they agreed to disagree. So in the map that was signed off in January 1916... Palestine is is coloured in brown, sort of yellowy brown colour, and they agree it will have an international administration because they can't really work out what to do about it. 
Is this is this really how they do? So they have a a, a, a map in black and white, and they, they've got crayons. Please tell me there were crayons. I love this notion in my head <laughs> of colouring in territories. And although, I mean, as you say, um, Palestine question is is not what it becomes at this point. There is a lot of trading going on over Lebanon, for example, and Mosul. Those are contentious areas. Tell us how that works. And how long is this meeting? Anyway, I mean, how, how, how do two powers carve up a region? The, the answer to that very last question is I'm not actually sure. So so what happens is that Pico went into the meeting with the British with, when he was arrayed against sort of multiple officials. That's inconclusive. He makes some big demands. Then the, the British start scratching their heads thinking this is a potentially really you know bad if it goes wrong. And at that point, Sykes like sort of Tigger arrives in the cabinet meeting in December 1915 and says, I've got a plan. And he produces a map and it's a square map. I actually, I now own a copy of this map, not, not the actual Sykes, not the, not the sykes Piquet map, but, but the basic map on which the deal was drawn was a, a map that the Royal Geographical Society had published in 1910. And you can occasionally come across copies of one of it. So I managed to to get one. It's about, it's a bit like holding a bit, bit narrower than an old broadsheet newspaper to hold in your hands. Wow. About similar. So the, the thing about this map is it's incredibly portable. All previous maps, high scale maps of the Ottoman Empire were vast because you've got to try and get everything from Constantinople. If, if you're just talking about the Eastern territory of the Ottoman Empire, you're trying to get Constantinople through to Basra on a piece of paper and you need to have a, a stretch that's bigger than mine to hold that map in your hands. And then you, if you do that, even if you're holding it, your nose is pressed against the map because you're so big. Um, so it's useless. But what the Royal Geographical Society did in 1910 was they produced this little map of the middle of the Middle East, the sort of the heartland that matters. And the fascinating thing, this is an exclusive for you, which I'm sure you'll be delighted by, is that Sykes actually helped draw that map. I hadn't realised oh this until now, but he, uh, both as a diplomat, and he had done it. He'd he'd actually trained in surveying in some way, and he helped draw the map that the Sykes Picot Agreement was eventually drawn onto. So he had this map. He goes into the cabinet meeting. He announces his line from the E of Acre to the last K of Kirkuk. Everyone there is delighted that here is a man who clears to have command of Arabic and. Uh, and Turkish and a, and a command of the issues. And the geography, yeah. A geography, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I ask a lot of these people where half these places were on the map, they'd have struggled. Here he is. He, he appears to be in full command of the detail. Let's delegate this job to him. And so at that point, that's December the 15th, 16th of, of 1915. At that point, he is told to go off and fix it with Pico. And I I can't remember the date on the the map, but it's early January 1916. So in a matter of three weeks, they had cooked this one up. And are they locked in a room together or what? what's the... I think so. I suspect that... Locked in uh, a room with crayons. Are... I mean, you know, Probably. just colouring in <laughs> regions. Uh, so the, yeah, so the map itself, so it has this diagonal line which runs, you know, south southwest to, to northeast across the region. And, the, and the, the vestige of this is still visible on the map. So if you think of Syria today, it's it's a a right-angled triangle with the right angle in the top left corner. And the diagonal line is its not exactly what Sykes and Pico drew on the map, but it... Memories of it. Yeah. That is, yeah, that is... So that's the, the, the vestiges of this of this line. But the two men sit there. Sykes had a nice house in um, Buckingham Gate. He, was, he lived just around the corner from Buckingham Palace. And uh, so I suspect they did they meet there? Did they meet? I don't I don't know exactly where they meet. They met. It's all a little bit unclear. But they they had his map. You had the three areas that were coloured in. There was a blue bit for what the French were going to get, and a red bit for what the British were going to get. And then to square the circle with what had been agreed with Sharif Hussein, they came up with a fudge. So so the blue area, the blue French area, and the red British area. The best thing is to look up. If you uh, search on the internet for Sykes Pico map, you'll, you you can see this for yourself as you as you listen to this. But the blue French area and the red British area were on the coast. So the red British area was at the head of what, what was then the Persian Gulf, the Gulf uh, covering Basra almost up to Baghdad, and the French area was Lebanon and Syria and a bit of sort of mushrooming into Turkey, and then inland the area was going to be split and the Arabs were going to get some autonomy there. So this was the sort of, the, this was the way they tried to square the circle with what had already been promised 
to Hussein. Is is the modern Israel Lebanon border again a vestige of this this crayoning exercise? That came that came later because that was thrashed out in the twenties by surveyors and the, and the Palestine on this map is a is a very very sort of simple shape. It's kind of a it's a sort of hard to describe. It's got it it, it runs down the Jordan, so you have everything sort right. of west of the uh, east of the Mediterranean. Uh, to the Jordan, and then there's a sort of a, a, a kind of curved line that carves round north of the Sinai Desert or peninsula. So, uh, and that was going to ha- that was going to be international because the French wanted this because they said, well, we've always you know protected the rights of of the religions in in Jerusalem in the Holy City, and the British desperately wanted it for their strategic plan, which was essentially to have all the territory between the Suez Canal and the the mountainous frontier of Persia. So Sykes walked out having failed, essentially. And one of the the, the fascinating details, I don't know how much you can read into this, but on the map that they drew, and this is so it's all, as you say, Anita, it's all in in blue and red and sort of a slightly dodgy ochre coloured crayon, all hand-drawn, no, there's no, I don't think it's even a ruler involved, it's, it's freehand. Where is this map today in the National Archives? So it's in the National Archives. And it's one of those things, it's so controversial that you can't, if you can go into that, anyone can go and look, go and get a but ticket. By appointment, go to the National it's not Archive. on display. Archives. You have to go and look at it in a special room, in fact, because, yeah. um, you know, it is an object of some controversy. Look, I mean, we, we, we are sort of heading heading towards the, the end of this. But this, we should remind everybody, is a top secret meeting and a top secret colouring in exercise. But there is one party <laughs> that needs to be informed about this, because for any of this to work, you need the Russians to allow it. Um, so what do the Russians say when they hear about this this grand plan cooked up between the French and the British? The two of them, Sykes and Pico, then go off to to St. Petersburg or Petrograd in in 1916 to sell this one to Sassanov. Just as Petrograd is about to go up in, in smoke with the revolution. And- yeah, exactly. So they go there. Actually, the, Russian, the Russians, I think, are okay about it because the Russians in the meantime want control of the, the Bosphorus Strait. That's, that's their key demand. So they get that. They get the, uh, the British and the French to agree to that. You just you just dropped that about uh, uh, giving the Russians control of the Bosphorus, but hasn't the whole of Anglo-French policy for 150 years been to keep the Russians away from the Bosphorus? Exactly, and and you know, and the and the British until 1907 regarded the Russians as public enemy number one, really, and will so again do so again immediately after the revolution. Pre- precisely, so it's just it's a sort of you know it's a momentary hiatus, but the the Russians do accept it. But the, actually, Pico did stay on. I, I'm just struggling to remember the real detail of this, but Pico tried to stay on to get the Russians to support a French Palestine after you know. So to 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 so both sides had sort of agreed this deal. They didn't. It wasn't a it wasn't a deal. It wasn't a treaty. It was actually an exchange of letters in the end between the French ambassador in London, Paul Cambon. And and Sir Edward Grey, they 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 sent letters to each other in their own Amazing. language. So it's not a formal treaty. So like the Balfour Declaration, it's just a letter. So it has no final well, binding le- legal diplomatic. standing. What is the legal standing of this? I, I'm I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know. But it it's an exchange of letters. So the two sides swap letters, and even and that creates. It means it's an understanding. It, yeah, exactly. And and that and that essentially it's a sticking plaster. It's a diplomatic sticking plaster to resolve something which, as we said already, was you know it's already out of date because they weren't going to. Def- the Ottomans had proved uh, incredibly incredibly resilient, and you know Gallipoli had not succeeded, and yet this spat had had escalated out of all proportion. Uh, at what point does the world get to hear about Sykes Pico? Following the Russian Revolution, following the 1917 Revolution, because the you know the the the, the Bolsheviks enter the the the, the Tsarist archives and start throwing papers left, right, and centre and find this agreement, and uh, and and they say, what is this? You know, piece perfidious. of scurrilous, yeah. perfidious imperialist uh, wrangling, and it and they release. The, the agreement. So it's known about before the end of the war, and that creates enormous ructions. And famously, Enver Pasha, sitting in Constantinople, reads it out loud as soon as he hears about it from the Russians. And his main target is to show how 
far the Sharif of Mecca has been duped. Exactly. Because by this time, the Sharif of Mecca has risen up. The whole Arab world is is behind him. And he's saying, look, you've been you've been a complete sucker. These guys are doing this behind your back. You've been had. And been so had. he does it. And, and exactly. And that's that, that's exactly what happens. And and that takes. So, in fact, Lawrence is one of Lawrence of Arabia is one of the people who ends up papering that over. James, well, that's very, very elegant of you because the next episode um, is going to be all about the man in the middle of all of this, Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, and his experience of dealing and then finding out that the Arabs that he believes in have been double-crossed. But we'll come to that in a future podcast. In the meantime, just to finish the legacy of, of this agreement, which so many people have looked back on and seen as a classic piece of uh, British-French imperial treachery, what are the repercussions of this agreement made between these, these two sets of people sitting in a room in London in 1915 and 16? I think there's two things. Uh, one is very immediate, and that is that Britain realises it hasn't got what it wanted. And that is the background to the Balfour Declaration. So the Balfour Declaration comes out of the failings of the Sykes-Picot Agreement to guarantee British interests. That's the first thing. But more broadly, Sykes-Picot comes to be seen in the Middle East as this shorthand for imperial in, you know, interference. And there was a British, the British Council did a survey about this a few years ago. They asked people here and in France about Sykes-Picot, and they asked people in Turkey and I think Lebanon and Egypt about it. Had, had you heard of Sykes-Picot? And here the number's something like one out of 10. And if you go to Egypt, and these countries are not directly affected by this. In Everyone knows. You know, it's six and a half, seven out of 10. So there's a much higher level. This, again, is something we found throughout the series, that there's so many of these imperial decisions that are barely known about in England that feature, if at all, glancingly in our curriculums. And yet people around the world trace the disasters around them to these imperial decisions. And in this case, also, it leaves you know, the Kurds and the Druze, minorities like this, split between, between two different line, sides of a border classic sort of imperial mismanagement and, and, and with terrible repercussions for hundreds of thousands of people. Exactly. And, and done, as you, as you said, you know, in a very, very short amount of time by two people who didn't exactly know what they were doing. James, that is a fantastic and, and, and fantastically uh, learned look at this crucial thing. I've, I've often heard of and, and, and read about Sykes-Pico, but I've never heard it explained so clearly and so fully as by you here. And, and, and it is just, just utterly jaw-dropping. Baffling. The, 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 baffling the how, how a few people uh, making bad decisions uh, in a room in London can affect hundreds of thousands of people across the globe to this day, to this moment now. Uh, so thank you so much. Really thank grateful. You. Thank you very much. That is all from Empire. Uh, but as I said, Lawrence of Arabia next up. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnand. And goodbye from me, William Drimple. <laughs>